everybody to Sippin' and Shippin'. I'm your host, Brian Weinstein. We'll be kicking it here every other Friday, quenching your thirst for an insider's take to enhance your customer experience. So grab your drink of choice, kick back, it's Sippin' and Shippin' time. All right, welcome to another episode of Sippin' and Shippin'. I am your host, Caitlin Postel. If you couldn't tell, I have officially hijacked the pod here. We gave Brian the boot. Uh, we started a soft launch last episode with Joanne Marciano from Grace and Clothier, and now we are officially marching into Women's History Month. Joining me today, I have not one, not two, but three very special guests, our very own from Rider E-Commerce by Whiplash, Eva DeCecco, Bree Chapman, and Ella Monner. Thank you, ladies, for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, of course, I'm excited for this conversation. So to get started and to get acquainted with uh, with the audience, obviously we know each other, um, but I'd like to start uh, with a little, uh, I guess an icebreaker we can call it. Um, but what I'd like to hear from, from you ladies is, what you wanted to be when you grew up, because I don't think anyone was in kindergarten sitting down writing logistics leader at Rider E-Commerce by Whiplash. So what you wanted to be when you grew up and what your current role is here at Rider E-Commerce. Uh, Ella, you wanna get us started? Yeah, nice to meet everyone. So my name's Ella Monarch. Who? what I wanted to be when I grew up, I feel like I always wanted to be like on the Disney Channel. Yeah. Like I wanted to be like <laughs> Hannah Montana on a TV show. Who did it? Writing music, like touring. That was always my like MO when I was growing up. But alas, um, my superstardom <laughs> didn't work out. Um, but I currently am on the business development team here at Rider Commerce by Whiplash. Um, I've been with the company for it'll be four years in July. So. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, Brie? First of all, Ella, I just have to say that there's still time. You can still get on the Disney <laughs> Channel. Don't let that sure. die. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is uh, Brie Chapman. So um, I have been with Ridery Commerce by Whiplash for about six months. I think I had my six-month anniversary on February 22nd. And I am a part of the partnerships uh, team here. So I lead our strategic partner program. And when I was growing up, I actually wanted to be in medicine. Um, so up until I was about 15 years old, that was my career path. I was accepted to an international baccalaureate program uh, at a school in London, and I was planning to move there, but then got cold feet at the last minute, much to my mom's dismay because she was born and raised in the United Kingdom. So she was really looking oh. to get back. And then I pulled the plug at the last minute. So I always think back to what would have happened if I had stayed the course and gotten into medicine. Um, but unfortunately, it's probably a good thing that I decided not to because my chemistry grades in um, university and in high school were awful. So yeah, that very, is, uh, that's unfortunately very, why it didn't work out for me. Um, but my biology was great. My chemistry and my chemistry and physics were terrible. Interesting. I never knew that about you. And, you know, funny, I wanted to be a physical therapist and I got my first C ever in biology. So I was like, this is not going to work for me. I guess I'll just go into sales. So um, Eva, what about you? Yeah, so clearly Ella and I are from different decades. Well, she wanted to be a la Hannah, Hannah Montana. I wanted to be Olivia Newton-John. I wanted to be Sandy from Greece and dance and sing and go to high school and have a great Australian <laughs> accent. <laughs> so that was my goal. Um, but currently, here I am with Whiplash, Riot Rider E-Commerce by Whiplash, and I've been here for three and a half years, and I am currently the Vice President of Operations here, running all of the buildings across the network. Yeah, you sure are, and doing a fantastic job at it. Um, Eva, so as far as your background is concerned, um, I know you had two long stints, one at Old Navy, uh, one at H&M. Can you give the audience a little bit of insight as to what it was like in those early stages of your career as a woman in logistics we've talked about it on the program before historically more of a man's world um yeah give us a little bit of a background on that sure so my old navy uh experience was all retail stores so i worked on the floor i, I led the teams on the floor and managed that process and uh, i spent 10 years there and then went over into h m and h m is where i really gained my experience in logistics i spent 13 years with them uh, the first part of my career with H&M, I actually was in stores and in controlling, right? Which wow. is completely not what 
you would think, because here I am in logistics, so a completely different world. <laughs> uh, but I started off, you know, running one building for H&M and eventually took over North America. And so ran Mexico, Colombia, the U.S., and Canada. And I think for me, I mean, Old Navy was a great organization that that really had a lot of women in leadership positions. And okay. so it, I just kind of joined in, right? But for me, it was always about, I belong at the table, right? And so that's my mindset. That. I, I always believed that I deserved a seat at the table, regardless if I was a man, woman, or child. It didn't matter. And that's how I think that I've just um, been able to be successful and move forward and share my ideas and and lead teams right so that's yeah. that's that's what i did and i was fortunate enough to join a rider e-commerce three years ago knowing a lot of people that worked with us right so sure. h&m had 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 a partnership with uh e rider e-commerce <laughs> you don't know which name to use i know i know everybody um, but so I had a lot of relationships and those relationships is what made me want to come. Great yeah. relationships, a great environment, a lot of great people that work for the organization. And it just seemed like a really natural fit for me. Yeah, it sounds like it. So it sounds like there were some um, existing women leaders who kind of inspired you in their early days and then networking. So you knew a lot of the folks and in, in, as your roles progressed. Um, as far as your transition from Old Navy going to H&M, what, what made you pivot there and go, go to that side? So I actually, from Old Navy, I went to H&M kind of in the same sort of roles, right? Okay. From store to store, right? It was just a Old Navy store at one point, and then it was an H&M store. But within my world of H&M, as I was a controller, I went into the logistics world. And it's kind of a funny story. I was uh, just about to move to New Jersey, and the leaders of H&M came to me and said, we need a really strong leader to come in and run the warehouse in New Jersey. We hear you're moving there. What do you think? And I said, you must be crazy. I'm a controller. What do I know about running a warehouse? Yeah. And so they asked me to, you know, go in there for a few weeks, check it out, see what I liked. And I loved it. It was great. I loved it because it's problem solving. I loved it because it's fast moving. Uh, and it just gave me something else to learn and understand. And so I, I, I dug my heels in and I learned everything there was about running a building and then just went on from there. And so awesome. it was a lot of fun and just a really new experience for me. Yeah, it sounds like it. So from Sandra D to retail, to controller, <laughs> to running to running buildings, Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So moving on to, to Brie. Brie, I know your path. I know you refer to yourself as a Swiss army knife, which I love that metaphor. Um, I've seen you in action, so I believe it. I've seen it. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience and your career path. Um, I think your roles um, pertain most to this theme for this 2023 Women's History Month, which is women who tell stories. So women who are in media, women who do podcasts, uh, women who are doing print, radio, TV, stage, blogs, news, social media. Um, tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I have a bit of a storied career path. I've done a few different things, all with the theme of me just talking a lot to people. <laughs> so I feel like I'm the perfect guest for this podcast. Um, so I have always been in customer-facing roles. I really tried to make marketing work for me when I was getting out of university, I thought that marketing was the sexiest career path and that's what I wanted to do. Sure. Um, but try as I might, I could not find anyone who wanted a university grad with no experience to hire into a marketing role because that's just what happens when you graduate is it's very difficult to find work. So uh, I was living in Victoria, BC at the time and I got a job offer from a company called Neverblue, which was an affiliate marketing company. Um, so that's really where my career started is very low level entry data work. Um, but I okay. quickly realized that I'm a social butterfly. I am an extrovert to the nth degree. And I was put pretty quickly into um, an affiliate account management role. And so that is how I got my start in business development um, and sales. And I spent about six years in that industry before I managed to convince the fine folks at Shopify that I was worthy of a sales role there. So sure. that is how my 
professional sales career took off. Um, I spent five years at Shopify. Uh, I was in um, a sales role there for two years. I uh, did a couple of maternity leaves, but also did some time in a sales enablement role and in content marketing. So I've always had a love of uh, communication. Um, okay. So whether that is communicating with um, business owners, whether that's written communication, um, you know, video, like you said, I have a I moonlight as a content creator on Instagram as well. So uh, I've got a larger than average Instagram following. Um, I just love to meet people. I just love to talk to people. I love to hear people's stories. I love to tell my own story. And I love to figure out how to tell the stories of brands and companies in a way that is meaningful and interesting. Um, so that's kind of how I've gotten to where I am today in the partnership space. I feel like uh, being a partnerships professional, you have to have... Um, you have to wear a lot of different hats. Um, so one right. day you're doing enablement, one day you're doing content, one day you're doing sales, one day you're negotiating. Um, so it's a really, really interesting career and I feel like it marries all of the things that I'm passionate about pretty well. Yeah, awesome. And I know, so Shopify is probably our most well-known um, with this audience and we had our very own Caitlin Teed on talking about the community um, that was at Shopify. What was your experience as a woman in that space just as far as diversity, inclusion, and mostly equity? Um, how did you feel coming up in that role um, as a woman? Um, so I think that it's, I'm not going to say it's perfect. Um, sure. I don't see Shopify with rose colored glasses as some people do. Um, okay. I think that the, I, th I think especially in the craft of sales, there's still a lot of work to be done to amplify female voices and to, um, like Eva was saying, give women a seat at the table. Um, I think I did very, very well in my sales job there. Um, I, you know, was at the top of the leaderboards while I was pregnant and selling, um, but I still didn't feel like I was taken very seriously. Um, so I think that there there's some work to be done internally there as far as making sure that women feel like they are um, motivated to continue to succeed and to get promoted into roles that are meaningful. There are some amazing, some incredible women leaders there. Um, don't get me wrong, but I do think that when it comes to the sales side of things, um, male voices are still the most dominant. Sure. Yeah. And I think that makes sense for kind of bigger orgs, but what a different experience from, for Eva coming from H&M where they were like, hey, you're the leader we want versus the male voice. I know in my experience, my previous role, 10 years in the seat that I was in, still working for the director and VP who five years after my exit, they're still the VP and director, great folks. But my biggest cheerleader, one of my first mentors was my director who led the sales team with a female voice. So to be able to see that was super impactful for me and just being empowered. Um, she never turned down my success or, or in fact, she actually bolstered me up maybe a little bit more than I should have at some times. Um, but I hear you that sometimes uh, the male voice takes the lead at that table, which- uh, Strong not a, not personality too. Like I sure. am not a, I'm not a dormant individual. I do not no have way. a problem. <laughs> I don't have a problem <laughs> voicing my opinions, clearly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that there's some also some work to be done with making sure that those who are not like me, who may have more difficulty raising their hand, are also accounted for. Um, I think especially as organizations continue to grow, that is something that is so, so important is to make sure that everyone feels like they are a part of the conversation. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Eva, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I think Brianna's right. I think our job as leaders that are women in this industry, it's very important to ensure that women around us know that it's okay, that it's okay to speak your mind. It's okay to share your opinion. It's okay to be a strong personality. I think as women, we're, we're you know, sometimes taught like to just sit there with our hands folded and that's yep. not how it should be. And no, and it's super important that everyone around us understands that they have a voice and they should be heard and their opinion matters. Yeah, agreed. I think courage comes to mind as you're as you're speaking, right? Having the courage within yourself, but even seeing the courage in other female leaders, I think is just truly inspiring. Uh, yeah, couldn't agree more. Courage okay. and confidence, right? Like huh. Confidence totally. even on days where you might not feel confident yourself, but showing up every day and just, you know, maybe you have to fake it till you make it one day, but having that kind of confidence really is what sets you apart. Yeah, totally. Spoken like a true Hannah Montana, put on that <laughs> transition over. Uh, Ella, 
Um, can you tell us a little bit about what made you choose uh, Rider? I know you started, what is it, four years or three years mm -hmm. ago? Three mm -hmm. years ago, um, Rider Sales University. What was that like? Yeah, so I really started this journey when I was a senior in college at the University of Tennessee. Um, ding, 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 I, there it is. The old <laughs> University yeah, quick, of quick Tennessee. Plug. Yep. So <laughs> But yeah, like any other senior in college, you're approaching the finish line and, you know, you you have this thought of, I got to get a job. I got to figure something out. I got to, you know, what's my plan after school? And I, at the time, was taking a course um, in professional selling. And okay. I was a marketing major and, you know, kind of just taking this course to see what what sales could be like in, in as a career. Um, and so I got... Um, introduced to Ryder through that class and okay. heard about this program they were doing for the first time. Um, and it was an 18 month sales training program, learning all about supply chain, dedicated transportation and logistics sales and how that, you know, really works. And so I got involved. I, I started the interview process. I was really interested in the program. I liked the fact that it was an individualized learning path. It wasn't just a job that was, you know, we're going to train you for three weeks and then we're throwing you to the wolves and you got to sink or swim. It was very much, we're, we're going to learn, we're going to teach you all about this complex world and this a uh, long sales cycle and teach you about negotiating a contract and the financials and what this operationally looks like. And it was just a new world for me. Um, it was something I hadn't studied in school. I didn't know a ton about, but I liked the idea of moving into a new industry and taking the time to really learn and develop. Um, yeah. And it was exciting too, because the job required me to move to Miami Oh, um, so that was really attractive to perk. me, just being from Knoxville, <laughs> Tennessee and going to, you know, South Florida and just kind of starting your adulthood in a new place and taking me out of my comfort zone. So there was a lot about it that I was really excited about. And um, that was kind of what attracted me to the role at that time. Yeah, amazing. And we're glad that you did because you're certainly kicking ass in the sales side, <laughs> filling that pipeline, closing deals like a boss. So it sounds like the format, like the formal approach and the methodical approach of career development really perked your interest and in to, to get into this space. I mean, supply chain so big at that time, um, people really starting to bring that to the forefront. You know, my experience was a little less formal, um, as you all know, but the audience may not. I went to Brian Weinstein University, so I shadowed Brian for for about a year and a half, and I certainly wasn't in Miami, uh, but we were we were all over the map, and it just lended for a different experience. But um, during that time, those 18 months, can you tell the audience? Did you were there any mentorship opportunities, male or female? Um, how were the folks within the organization? Were they welcoming? What what was that experience like? Yeah, so the way the program was set up was that the first six months was really, you know, at our headquarters, learning a little bit more about rider solutions and what we do and how the company operates. And then the second six months was operational site visits. So, you know, I flew all over the United States going to our different facilities, really learning, you know, more about that boots on the ground aspect of what we do and learning the operational side of the business. And then the last six months was mentorship. So okay. I, I met two individuals who are on the sales team at Ryder and they really became my mentors. And then along the way too, I gradually, you know, would meet people and, and develop relationships that turned out to be kind of like a mentorship relationship. But, um, it was funny. Both of my mentors, um, were, were males and, okay. um, and it was something I hadn't really thought about at the time. It was just kind of like, okay, these are two really successful individuals at the organization who I can learn a lot from. Um, so I didn't really think too much about it, but they were fantastic and constantly challenged me and brought me out of my comfort zone, which I really appreciated at the time. I actually remember this one instance when I was catching up with my mentor, talking about what he had going on in his pipeline, deals he was working on, and I was asking him questions, and we got to like the last three minutes of the call, and he said, oh, by the way, I have a leadership call after this where I have to pitch my deal to our leadership team, and I want you to run it. I want you to lead the call. With three minutes notice. A three-minute notice, Oof. and I was 
scared to my core. I was so nervous. You know, you just heart, your heart sinks to the bottom of your stomach. Yeah. But he had that kind of confidence in me. And we had that kind of mentor mentee relationship where he was like, I know you can do this and I'm going to challenge you in this way. And so I really appreciated that. And I really appreciated any time where my mentors, you know, felt enough confidence in me to, to challenge me and bring me out of my comfort zone like that. Yeah. I love that. Talk about trust fall. Oh yeah. Right? Oh yeah. <laughs> Just backwards. Uh, Brie, any, any experience with mentorships throughout your career? Yeah. So I think one experience that really stands out to me is when I was actually in, um, my sales enablement role at Shopify. So I had, I worked with a fantastic woman there. Um, and I had never really had really, really strong female leadership before. No one that I felt like I really looked up to, but she was just such an exemplary human, um, who again, you know, like Ella was saying, she stretched me in ways that I didn't think I could be stretched. She was such a formidable, she, just a formidable talent in sales enablement. She was so organized. Um, she had everything that I felt like I was missing. Um, and so she really worked with me closely during our time together to help me understand that I was capable of doing these things, that I, the, the skills that I thought I was never going to have in my tool belt, tools I thought I was never going to have in my tool belt, um, I could have. And I think through working with her, I just realized that limiting beliefs are so powerful and that if you basically every thought that comes into your head, every negative thought is a lie. You're just the only person that can hear it, right? So things that I think about myself and things that I thought that I would never be able to do, other people would never say that about me. Other people will be like, you are absolutely crazy. You're out of my, your mind. Of course you can do this. But because you're saying those things to yourself, you're the only person that hears them, right? So she yeah. really forced, she really forced me to get uncomfortable um, in my role and she forced me to take a really good hard look at myself and and listen to those limiting beliefs in a different way. And so I think that that has made a massive difference for me in my career, in the opportunities that I've been able to explore, in being able to stretch myself out of my comfort zone, in taking on roles like this in an industry I knew nothing about, working with a team where I knew absolutely no one. Um, I went back to Shopify after Matley because it was comfortable for me. And in right. working with her, um, I realized that comfort is sometimes... It can, be, it be, it can be good at certain points in your life, but there's certain points in your life where stepping out of your comfort zone is going to be the best thing for you. So I'm forever grateful to her for showing me that I am more than the voices in my head. Sure. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I, I couldn't relate more um, just as far as get comfortable feeling uncomfortable, right? That's when you see a hundred memes about it and inspirational quotes. That's where the growth happens outside of the comfort zone. But it's so true. Um, I, I couldn't relate more to that. And Eva, as a leader, now VP of Ops for, for, our, for a company, what is it that you do? What are some strategies that you take to inspire and really empower um, the ops ladies that are running these buildings day in and day out? Uh, I think it, it goes back to what I said a little earlier in that they all need to understand they deserve the seat at the table, right? Sure. But being able to give them some responsibility to get them out of their comfort zone, to make them feel uncomfortable so that they can grow, but to give them just the opportunity to be successful. So it's really an opportunity as a leader in this organization, which has many women leaders, I might add, uh, yeah. to just say, it's okay to be you. Let's see what you have to offer and let's see how we can make you grow and what kind of development can we give you to help you be successful? And that's what I try to do. Awesome. Love give that an opportunity. All right. So to wrap it up here, can we give two last pieces of advice? Ella, what would be your takeaway or what would you tell to, to someone coming right out of college as far as landing at an organization that makes sense for them as a woman? I think my advice would be just be a sponge. Every person you come in contact with and encounter on a day-to-day, -day, you have something to learn from them. And don't be intimidated by your youth um, because you're young, and that's just a fact. Everyone's been young and new in their career at some point. So just be a sponge. Um, you know, put yourself in front of people who are powerful um, and put yourself in front of leadership and those that have been in an organization for many, many years because you, you have so much to learn from them. And just be humble, but also be confident and be courageous and don't be afraid to speak up.
Yeah. Awesome. I'm still sponging. I, I haven't stopped sponging. I, I think it's just an ongoing process. And Bree, final thoughts here, advice that you would give. Again, don't listen to the voices in your head. They are your own worst enemy. And I think that we are all capable of doing great things. We're all capable of being more than we are today. Um, and I'm just so grateful that um, I've always, you know, that right now I'm so surrounded by people that empower me and encourage me to do more. So I would say, take your time, make sure that you really understand where your leadership's values, core values are, and make sure that they align with yours and make sure that you work with somebody that you trust to continue to amplify your voice. Yeah. Understood. Got it. So I heard a lot of trust. I heard courage, inspiring, mentorship, a lot of great stuff to, to kick us off here in Women's History Month. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you, Bree. Thank you, Ella. I'm truly inspired and privileged to work with you all on a daily basis and all of the women leaders and men, of course, within our organization. Um, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode. Make sure you check us out every other Friday on your favorite podcast platform. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank Bye. you.